are there any women artists in your collection? I said, yeah, well, here's uh, Jean Claus and da-da-da-da. And by the way, uh, there's 65 Navajo rugs. Those are all women. And you're looking at 300 pots. All of those are women. The women in this collection outnumber the men probably 10 to 1. Yeah. I did start out painting cowboys in 1975. I, I'm never going to have one of my paintings. There's always going to be cowboys, and they're always going to be shooting each other, and blah, blah, blah. And then four years later, I painted my first cow contemporary cowgirl portrait. Right. And then slowly, <laughs> the women have taken over. <laughs> Is that 1870s or 60s? Keep going. Earlier? Are you thinking that's a Kiapqua? All red. All red? On the bottom. Oh. Is it got a, yeah. a pookie mm -hmm. deal? Yeah, I'll show it to you afterward. Boy, you used to see those, but not much anymore. I've only had one other like it. I've got I've Billy. I got Billy Shank here. Billy's <laughs> admiring my pots. He's trying to figure out a way to... It doesn't matter where he is. He's going to be looking at the pots. He walks into my office. I got good art in right. my office. He hasn't said anything about the the uh, cannons, TC cannons. Now he's looking at. I a haven't even looked at him. Classic yet. Uh, little child's blanket I have, and a great pot that I have. <laughs> Last time we was down here, it cost me twelve thousand dollars just to deliver paintings because I walked out with a you're, late classic yeah, blanket. Yeah, you're not out of here yet. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Yeah, we'll do and some. I have a pile of them, and they all provenance. Mark Sublet, Mark Sublet, <laughs> Mark Sublet, Mark Sublet. Yeah. Well, and you brought us some paintings in. Let's see. I don't see any of my blankets on those. We're looking at a painting that's actually hanging on the wall. For those who are watching YouTube, we no. That was the one on the right is from an old black and white photograph. Ah, okay. From about 1905, she's walking away. It's what? at a train station, and it's with an Acoma pot on her head. Right. She didn't make the sale. And no. Yeah. <laughs> Not that day. Not if she's walking away. <laughs> or maybe she's just going to get water and they're coming back. Yeah. No, she's probably walking away. <laughs> and her friends are saying something to her. We'll put this painting on the YouTube video. Now, Billy has come and talked before, and we had a great conversation. Yep. But, you know, when you have a pandemic, you don't get to tra get artists to come in very often and build this. And so I want to get an update from you, and just some things are going on for people to know what's happening well, in your life. Just as this happened... Uh, in late February, right. mid-February, as we had our first case in the U.S., then promptly I decided to have a heart attack. So, um, Yeah, tell us about that. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I went to bed around uh, 10.30, and by 11 o'clock I was back up, and I mean, I was in unbelievable pain. And I thought I had uh, severe heart yeah, yeah. indigestion because I have a history of that too. So I'm writhing around and going, oh, oh, oh you know, and um, crushing chest pain with radiation to your right arm, probably. Well, both. Yeah. And that was the giveaway. I, my left arm, no, my right arm, the pain was going all the way down, yep. all the way to my wrist, up to the end, what do you call that, the pinky finger, yeah, fifth, and to the thumb. And I just kept, you know, shaking it like it was going right. to, you know, it wouldn't stop. And this side was down to my elbow. Yeah. So. Bunny decided we better take me to the hospital. And she did, you know, put her hand on my back and so forth. This man, you are really clammy. And I knew that that's not yeah. uh, indigestion or, you know, heartburn or whatever. So we went over to um, uh, the, the Presbyterian Hospital, which is closest to us. And, boy, I mean, a crew came out. Bang, bang, bang. And they had me in a room and, you know, had me hooked up to this and that. And uh, the doctor who was on duty... I said, we don't have a cardiologist here tonight, so we're going to have to put you in an ambulance and send you back up to St. Vincent's, which is the other hospital in uh, uh, Santa Fe. Right. But in the meantime, she said, you have had a heart attack. And I oh, you're kidding me. I did? <laughs> yeah. So They drew enzymes? They drew blood from you? Yeah. Yeah. They did, yeah. And then... Um, then we went over to St. Vincent's, and the, they must have called ahead or whatever, because when Buddy and I... Oh no, that was. Uh, oh, I'm mixing up two different um, two emergency rooms, rooms but <laughs> I mean, I remember maybe it was the first one. There was nobody there, but the person at the desk. I hadn't even signed my name, or whatever, and I mean, this crew just came out yeah. so fast. There was five or six people, and they had me on a gurney, put me in a room. Of course, at St. Vincent's, they were waiting for me since they called ahead and we had an ambulance. So. Um, I can't remember what all we did, except I still was in major pain. And, you know, nowadays everybody wants to give you Dilaudin 
Yeah, for pain. Uh, for pain. Yeah. And I've had that before with another surgery, and I can't stand that stuff. So at least I figured out twice I've had that, and it just hallucinates. It's just awful. Yeah. So I made sure I was animate. Give me morphine, which I've had a number of times from kidney stones. Right. So finally I calmed down. I quit thrashing. And, uh, yeah, because it was just crushing chest pain that wouldn't stop. Yeah, and I was just like, you know, just hyper. And I was yeah. hyperventilating, you know, I was even, you know, like crying in between. I just, it was so intense. Because of the pain. Yeah. Yeah. I've never felt, I mean, I've had kidney stones, and they always say, well, that's as bad as, you know, a woman being pregnant. I don't know. I can't make that comparison. But this pain topped any kidney stone pain I've ever had. Mm. Until it finally calmed down. And um, uh, another doctor friend of mine who also is a collector of ours who lives just south of Albuquerque call, found out. And so she called up and I didn't, unbeknownst to me. So they put me in this like suite, like a presidential suite. And I, wow, gee, all by myself. And I mean, all this room and people are coming and going. And um, <laughs> it was really wild. So, um, they admitted me in, I think, in the at St. Vincent's around two o'clock in the morning. But they had me scheduled for one o'clock um, next day. Uh, yeah, for stents. Yep. Yep. And so um, we, you know, went in and boy, here we go, another crew. I mean, right. it looked like an industrial complex inside, and there must have been fifteen people. And uh, I was talking until I went out, mm -hmm. and you know, then I'm back out in the in my room recovering, I didn't feel anything. I mean, nothing. It all felt great. Did you feel better when you, after you had the stents, like you, more well, energy? That was, yeah. I mean, immediately I, I managed to talk my way out of the, out of the hospital the very next morning. Yeah. So they only kept me over that one other night. And I did a whole lot of jive talking to get them to quit all this beeping stuff and unhook me so I could actually sleep. And they said, we're going to check you every hour. I said, I can't sleep that way. I need some rest. Why don't you come in at midnight, come in again at 4? Yeah. And they agreed. So <laughs> by 10 o'clock, I had my walking papers, and I go home. And, man, I had not felt that good in more than a decade. I just had all this energy. And, I, you know, I rodeo and I ride the um, I, this ranch sorting stuff we do. And it causes me so much pain in my left hip and down through the left leg that I... Just religiously take a 600 ibuprofen, and I snap a, a 325 hydrocodone in half, and just right. take those before riding. Take them again for four hours later, so I can get through the day. So after this, and I, plus, I couldn't walk any distance, so I really can't go out and you know do it. Two because miles. of pain in your hip. Yeah. Yeah. And in my back because yeah. I've ruptured discs before playing basketball and rodeoing. So anyway. I'm finding I can walk all over the place I can, and without pain. And so when we went back to see the cardiologist six days after he put the stents in, right. um, I asked him, could I start riding my horse again? And I mean hard and fast because we work cattle. He's, if you feel like it, do it. So I went home, saddled up the horse, put the cows in the pen, and we did that for three days in a row. And I didn't take any hydroprofen, nothing. I didn't hmm. feel any pain. I thought, I haven't ridden without pain seriously in more than a decade. Hmm. And I, I can't walk great distances, but I can still walk, uh -huh. you know, a while. I mean, I have slight pain, but it was all because of the lack of oxygen. Yeah. And you weren't feeling uh, short of breath or anything when you were doing all that? Uh -uh. Just pain in your hip. Interesting. Yep. <clears throat> so when you're sitting there on that gurney, and they said you've had a heart attack, and you're feeling like, yeah, I've had a heart attack. What does that do to you as a person as far as, you know, do oh, you reevaluate life at that moment? No, because I've done this before. I mean, not a heart attack, but this is number five for bullets that I've dodged. Yes. So uh, they think I'm a great patient because I have such an insane and gallows sense of humor. I mean, I was just kidding with them and talking with them. Well, I just, okay, had a heart attack. Never did that before. Um, <laughs> let's say I've had cancer. Okay, we're done with that. Uh, nearly drowned in a canoe wreck, pff, done with that. Walked out of a car wreck, the only survivor when I was a kid. So bring it on. 
So you're I'm still here. Your mortality is you're okay with it, however it ends. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I am not a person that wants to live to be a hundred years old. I was I'm still very close to my first wife. We were uh, sweethearts when we were in high school and we moved to New York after we got out of art school and she stayed, we separated and I still very close to her and I was just talking to her the other day. Um I says, Well, I wanna live to be a hundred and I thought Gosh, really? I mean, we're 73. What do you want to do for 27 years? Yeah. You know, we're compromised. We're, you know, you you fumble a little bit. You're not as graceful as you used to be. You can't do all kinds of things that you used to be. But, of course, mentally you adjust to that. But right. 27 more years of that? Not, not me. But what if you can paint and ride your horses? Well, I will stay on the earth as long as I can do both of those. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, a friend of mine was um, was very close with Paul Pletka. Um, I'm not sure whether this is public knowledge or not, but he, um, I, I, th I think he's got Parkinson's, and he's had to retrain himself mm. to go from right-handed to paint and write left-handed. Yeah, wow. So you make adjustments. I mean, we all do, you know, whatever it takes. And what adjustments have you had to make since this? None. Yeah, you have more health. You actually feel better. <laughs> right. And you can actually I mean, paint longer. I can't, my memory is a little bit, you know, shot through with holes. But, um, well, since this whole pa pandemic started, I've had studio assistants with me physically in my studio space since 19, late 1970, early 1971. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden the challenge for me is I'm going to go paint every day but I don't know what it's like, like other artists who paint in their own studio by themselves. Right. And I think, oh my God, this is going to be traumatic, this change. Wasn't at all. Got used to it right away. And I thought, wow, I can even concentrate more because there's no distractions. Mm. I can play the music I want, you know, without having to worry about, is this making somebody else crazy that's right. in the room with me or uh, whatever. So I'm not painting as many hours, but I paint four to six Hours a day. Yeah. Yeah. And since, um, the, the, you know, I this pandemic started, I uh, I called this new series that I'm doing, the quarantine series, because the paintings were all smaller. This is one of the very first ones mm -hmm. from that group. But there's about 20 of them now. And they're all 24, 24, 20, 20, 16, 20. And that's normally not a scale that I like to work at. But Because you like bigger? Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't have to be giant anymore, but, you know, 30, 36, 40 by 50. Do you find it harder to do those as you age, to do the big ones? Um, if I'm Well, they're going to be more complicated. There's going to be... Right, more figures uh, and things. More figures and all that. And, you know, to get them right to the level that I want is sometimes it's just it's uh, mentally exhausting. Mm -hmm. To get those values and everything down to, to where I think they ought to be. I think my sense of color and my sense of uh, value is much more sophisticated at 73 than it was even at 63. Oh yeah, I agree with that 100%. You know, so yeah. now that you I've got a new your, level. You can see it in your paintings, I think. Yeah, and so as I do these small paintings and we've got them all up around my studio, it's critical that they all reach a high level of excellence, if you will. Right. And it's pretty obvious when they don't. But I'm also in the process of trying new stuff, which is easier to do on a smaller scale. It doesn't cost you as much time to fail mm. at a 24-24 as it does, you know, a 50 by 50. And a 50 by 50, don't you normally do a smaller one anyway to make sure Sometimes. just for that reason, if nothing else? Yeah, I mean, like a painting like this, I mean, I like this at this scale. And, you know, I might at some point in the future, you know, Make enlarge it, it. right yeah i'll tell you the other thing i do the, the the photographer that i work with um who does all the professional photography for publication and mm -hmm. so forth and he gives me an eight by eleven uh photograph as well and so i had them stacked up because sometimes now i refer to my own earlier paintings i go back to my shank in the 21st century book etc you know i look at Glenn Dean's work or Logan's or Maynard Dixon or Ed Mel or right. whomever. Right. Well, I got loose leaf binders and I put them in categorically. So instead of having loose photographs, just a stack here and a stack there all in my studio, I've got them in binders. So 
when I'm at a passage that's I need like some specific kind of reference to see if I could do it better than what exists mm -hmm. here, I just flip through the pages. Yep, that's what I want to do. That right there. I want to see what that skyline against that set of mesas, you know, in a and a like storm sky, for instance. So, and that could even be from pieces that were a long time ago. Yeah, it's really the yeah. composition that you're looking for, as much as anything. Yeah, I, I'll just give you another example. Um, once upon a time, I had done this. It's 75 by 55, a big um, nude from the waist up, cowboy hat, scarf, sunglasses, and in one hand, she's holding a glass of wine. Or champagne, and the other, she's holding the brim of her hat with a cigar. And in the background, it says a taste of the Golden West, and it's in a real kind of uh, whatever lettering would have been popular in the 1890s. So right. this was commissioned uh, by one of the popular bars on the town square in Jackson Hole, the Rancher Bar. And as long as they owned the bar, that painting was there. Um, then they sold it, the painting went into storage, and it had not been treated really well, so they asked me to do, you know, some very minor restoration, which I did. Then all of a sudden, I get a guy calls me up and he said, "You know, have you any idea what ever happened to that painting, A Taste of Golden West?" I said, "Boy, well, yeah, I got it in my possession." And wow, can I buy it? And I said, "Well, yeah, I mean, I got to go to the owners and right. see what kind of a price they do it for you." And then he asked specifically how what the size was. I don't know if I have a wall big enough for that. So in the meantime, I was looking at the photograph I had, and it's also in one of my books, and I've got the painting itself, and I thought, you know, I bet you I could just do the figure without all that writing. background. Yeah, without all the writing. And I'll bet you I can make those flesh tones infinitely better than what I had originally mm -hmm. in 1983. Yeah, I'm sure it'd be way different. And sure enough, the painting was sold to the same guy before I had the second coat of paint on it. And then I did another one. The same, and I thought, geez, I can actually paint nudes at this point <laughs> more effectively than I ever have in the in past. My, yeah. But I would apply the same, you know, flesh tones into the native figures that I do, like on horseback, you know, with blankets. So if I do a close up, because these, all these paintings are portraits, mm -hmm. and I've not sold portraits well for years. So this was a new challenge for me to see if I could scale down and just do a close-up hmm. of some of these full figures. And I'm liking what I'm seeing. I don't know if the rest of the world will. They better. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've sold portraits before of yours that you've done. On occasion, oh, yeah, yeah. But I haven't done that many. Yeah. Or I, I do them and, oh, they sell and then they don't. It's inconsistent, but I think I know how to do them much better now. But does that go into your idea of whether you're going to paint something because I think this will sell or is it really more from the no, inspiration of it's, it an was, idea? It, well, originally for that nude that was in the rancher, it was just, wow, I think I can do this better. Mm -hmm. And also um, w with, uh, with what the abilities I have now, I can also stretch in terms of subject matter uh, in ways that I would have slides. I was, God, I can't, I don't know what to do with this. I, it, it's going to be boring. So now, and I know from experience with my paint by number system, if it doesn't look right, it can tend to look cartoony. Mm. And cartoony in my work is death. Yes. N n even if people don't intellectualize what they're seeing intuitively, they're going to walk away from it. They're not compelled by it. So the less cartoony, in a more natural or real, the flesh tones or even the hat colors, the scarf, everything, bang, it's there. So then I just keep... That's why color is so important. Yeah. Because yeah. that's the difference, right? Really, right. it's not the composition. The composition set. It's how you make the... Well, I think that's what makes or breaks it. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's when I look around your gallery and I see paintings, you know, that I think I can't live without yeah. you know, <laughs> from other uh -huh. painters. That's because they really understand... Light, they understand their color. Right. In deep space, I'm always attracted to, you know. Um, and I, I look at those all the time. I think about when we did that uh, Maynard Dixon show and the artists that are living that are yes. um, influenced by Dixon. Um, I was right next to a great big painting of Josh Elliott's, of Monument Valley. Yes. Man, I died. 
to, I mean, I wanted that painting, but I, I come down here and I could be, I'd have to mortgage the ranch <laughs> in order to keep buying the paintings that I see that you've got that I like. But that was one of them. And that you, sticks in my head. I really you, love it. Yeah, I know painting. exactly. That was a fantastic. <laughs> He's amazing. He is. He is really quite yep. amazing. And, uh, you know, his show that we had for him hit right at the kind of the heart of when we were supposed to open at the pandemic. Oh, you did? And, yeah, it was like March 22nd or something. was when we were, So we couldn't have the opening at right. all. And um, we still sold over half his paintings. That's you know, great. At that time frame, yeah. And, yeah. Lo- and a lot of his big ones. And uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a redo. We're, we're calling it, I forget what we're calling it, but it's revisited. And in November, I think 15th, he's going to do another set that we're going to reopen the show. Hopefully we'll be able to actually have people come at that time. And I'll tell you one thing that I was made me feel really i was so cautious at first when this pandemic came i thought what's this going to do to the art market i mean who's going to want to be buying art in the middle of all this so i immediately i started paying attention to what auctions were coming up right and boy they kept staying in business like Polly larson had yeah uh you know 90 percent sale um of the work that she had there and i was totally impressed in fact she had a painting that we were bidding on of mine um, that was a seminal piece from '84 or something like that, and they had it estimated six to eight thousand. We quit bidding on it at twelve thousand and ended up selling for twenty. Yeah, which was good for me in the secondary market, and I was impressed with the fact that people are still stepping up, and I would see one auction after another. Yeah, they're selling, they're yeah. selling, they're selling, and we've continued to do the same. Actually, right, and I'm getting emails and phone calls and i mean not making the same kind of money that i was before but the fact that people have interest uh, you know curiosity maybe and it's everybody says well everybody's bored they're sitting at home they're tired of watching movies and this and that let's see what kind of art is on the i think way. there may be some of that i do <laughs> yeah. think there is some of that i also think yeah. there's something to be said that art is rejuvenating and makes you feel good. And when every day is a right. blistering attack of what's happening in, exactly. you know, to our society, yep. the thought of having new art, fresh art, things that make you smile or even just emotionally do something for you besides look at a TV and right. see the coronavirus floating <laughs> around. I think yeah. there's something about that. I mean, no, I, th- I, th- I think you're right. I really do. I mean, I know it's true for us, too. I don't buy so much art anymore. I have to be really really you know drawn drawn to it yeah but you know in that same Polly Larson auction there was an old friend of mine uh who when we were artists in New York he lived on the floor below me Tony King and uh he'd done a series of these large scale uh one five ten twenty hundred what five thousand I don't know all the denominations of the bills and he did them in polychrome I mean his own color palette and I thought they were just hysterical I thought they were way cool couldn't afford to buy the paintings but then he did a series of serigraphs and then we were out to visit him a couple years ago uh, when he had a retrospective um, in Napa Valley Mm -hmm. and I was so tempted to get one of those serigraphs at the time Um, and Bunny really likes them so here comes one and it's at auction at Polly's and I know it had to have been bought in Scottsdale for the brief time that um, Ivan Karp, who owned O.K. Harris, mm-hmm. had his gallery um, on Indian School or somewhere on Marshall Way or something like that back in the 80s. And this thing came back on the market, and the estimate was stupid low. And I knew nobody would know who Tony King is in Scottsdale. They mm-hmm. know who he is where he lives in California. They know right. him in New York. Bingo, we get to print for 250 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bonnie was ecstatic. We got into the truck right now. Yeah. We just picked it up. And so, in the meantime, I went ahead and negotiated another deal with Tony. And there were two other prints, and they're bigger. One is five feet wide, it's a bigger denomination. And I bought the two of them from him for almost nothing as well. It was almost like a goodwill gesture. Well, that was exciting. They didn't have to spend big money. Now I've got, you know, three new serographs. <laughs> Where are you going to put those? <laughs> well, uh, that's a major question. I don't know. Yeah. Because um, you, I mean, your house is loaded. It won't be in the yeah. house because they're contemporary. They'll probably yeah. be in the upper office until we get her casita finished. We were talking about that today because she'll be designing that space and the furniture. And yeah. She's got her own contemporary collection separate from mine. Yes. And so 
you know, these are hers. This so is Bonnie's. She, yeah. Well, one of the things I think that for me, and I hear it all the time, oh, I don't have the space. That's never stopped you, right? Never. N never stopped me. I've never considered whether a frame goes with this or that or when I bought it. I mean, no. I may change out frames. I, I've done that on a couple of right. pieces. Oh, yeah. Just to match up what I have. Oh, and, yeah. and that all works. But, we, you know, you buy what you love, what strikes yep. you, and don't worry about it. You'll find a spot. Well, on the other side of this casita, I think, I don't know if I told you before or not, we built a thousand square foot acclimatized units, completely yeah. sealed, and has, you know, AC and, and heat. And we keep it at 58. And it's story tracks from one end to the other. And there's 350 paintings, prints, drawings. So, and they're all, you know, provenance. They're all, you know, in our books. We know exactly because we have different stories yeah. around the property. We can rotate anything. Yeah. Right. I mean, I'm. You're a gallery in a way. Uh, yeah, Your own for, gallery for yeah. you. Billy Shank for Billy Shank. <laughs> now, all that stuff, your house and all this art right. is going to ultimately end up in a, a uh, in the foundation. foundation, right? Yeah, you... we, we, we have a lawyer now, and we've got all this paperwork, and that's our very next move since we've now made this trip you know, to Phoenix and to Tucson to see you and take care of some business. The next thing is now to sit down with him with all the paperwork he's got. And I have... You know, some questions about making this a foundation that has, like, my serigraph collection. I have the only complete collection of it in existence. And there's roughly 55 paintings of mine that I'm wanting to put in that. Let's just see if we can't start this before I'm dead. Right. Yeah. But that's, I mean, clearly in your mind. Oh, yeah. You know, and it has been way before you had a heart attack oh, or any yeah. of these other uh, things. No, I've been planning this for yeah. years. And why is that? What what's what's Why we, do you feel well, it's important to do that? When I bought that property in... Uh, Santa Fe, it was already a significant property because of John Brinkerhoff Jackson, who was the internationally renowned landscape architect. I mean, it was sort of philosophically hadn't been thought of in those terms, and he used to call it the vernacular landscape. So he was quite famous. Uh, he had studied at Harvard, um, taught at uh, Berkeley, and he built this property. And then when he died, uh, he had um, no heirs, and he donated the entire property to a, a foundation there in um, Santa Fe, and we bought it from them. Hmm. So I wanted to keep his vision alive. When was that that he built that? Well, he built it in 1965. Yes. And he died in 96. Yeah, it's interesting because it has such a, he seems so much older. Well, it's probably the way we restored it, too. Yeah. When, um, when he had the house, I mean, it was double-thick adobe walls and, and all kinds of wonderful eccentric, uh, you know, deep uh, flared window mm -hmm. frames and all that. But the wood was painted. Mm. Kind of a 60, I mean, wood floors, right. wood ceilings, wood. I mean, there was right. a lot of wood along with this adobe, and I love wood. I mean, I had log cabin, you know, we built... And Jackson, right. so I was ecstatic that I could get a, an older looking Adobe, and we just sanded and sanded paint <laughs> with a pile of kids, you know, from college and high right. school forever, and then I restained all that wood to match my Molesworth furniture. Right. And rather than have you know really white walls with a high contrast, you know, to darker Vegas. You know, we came down to a palette of mid-earth tones uh, that softened it all. But, of course, it made it a little harder to see the art. But I didn't care. And I wanted it to feel like a lodge, like circa 1925, mm. 1930. Like it has that. that feel. Pardon me? It has that feel, for sure. Yeah, Especially I mean, with the Molesworth furniture throughout. And, you know, I went up to Bandelier, and that was built by the National Park Service. I don't know who the architect was. But I just took photographs of that for reference. I would go down to the um, the church right off the plaza in uh, the museum, the Fine Art Museum. Right. I got that auditorium, and you know, and I looked at that stuff. And um, God, it was one other. Uh, but in any case, oh, uh, La Fonda. Yeah, everyone uses La Fonda. How you can know, you not? So that's kind of where my references were to build this. So yeah, it does feel 
Hmm, a lot older than it is. And it has all those huge cottonwood trees that have been there a long time. No, he planted that stuff. There was only one indigenous cottonwood tree on the whole property. I got the photo. I just found them again. And it's just hysterical. He planted everything in the 60s because the water table was so high. That's 60 years ago now. Yeah, (laughs) right. (laughs) And there's springs on the property. And so we have water where, you know, a lot of the Southwest is not. Right. Um, And that's right next to Los Galandrinos. Which has water too, and so it makes it a, and makes it nice to be able to have two museums that'll be kind yep. of back to back. It were a quarter mile apart. And do you envision it being something like O'Keefe's place and in, in uh, yeah Abiquiu? by appointment? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And plus, as you know, it is not just how we restored the house and the fact that we do have that Molesworth collection. We have a collection of prehistoric pots. We have contemporary and historic paintings. We have Navajo textiles which you now are probably the major percentage of those <laughs> like that. all of the house. Uh, and so we have had, as time has gone, gone by, I've gained a reputation for any number of different museum groups um, that you know put us on their itinerary. And yeah. even some of these travel outfits uh, that do this commercially, um, well, just from you design. Know. I always thought you have one of the greatest eyes just for design, pure oh, design. I appreciate that. Thanks. And, and it really is. I mean, you can see it in the way you put the paintings on the walls, how you design, <laughs> the furniture that matches the Molesworth that you design, right. the concept of how you go through it and, and how it's, I mean, are you going to have like a Barnes kind of foundation at Sensibilities where, this is where, it's go, this is where it's hung and you don't touch it kind of thing? Well, I'm hoping that's what's going to happen. I don't know how much I can you know, restraining. Uh, but that's that has been my vision. Yeah, it's I been my see vision it. for more than 10 years. Yes. I mean, this was going to be my last great epic chapter. Right. Was to do this and leave this vision. And it just keeps being reconfirmed because I have all these different groups who love, that are just saying, oh, this was our favorite destination. Yeah, no, it is. It's super group. interesting. You know, they go up to Museum Hill, they go to Glen of Good Acres or to O'Keefe's house or to the museums um, or over to uh, Nidra Matucci's, uh, which is, you know, historic. And they love our place. It just is uh, less intimidating. It's be, I mean, you can be around the art and, and it's okay if you touch it. Right. At my house. Right. It's okay. You can walk on the Navajo rugs. Yeah, and, it's and all t- right. until it's actually the foundations and they own it. Yeah, and then I don't know what's then you, <laughs> You'll be probably not around at that point. Right, right. Well, it's interesting because it is a mixture of historic contemporary, because you collect yep. a lot of contemporary artists like Marilyn and, and some of these individuals, Zemensky right. and stuff, in your own collection. Oh, yeah. And then you have historic art. You have Native American art. You right. have early Western furniture by Molesworth. So you kind of have the whole gamut, and you're still adding. Uh, yeah, slowly. There's really not much more that we need to, uh-huh. you know, because sure. we've got my mom's house filled sure. up with all this stuff. We're redoing the guest house next. I mean, just bringing it up to speed, changing the the plumbing and the heating, new roof and all that. And, you know, I love to publish, so I yeah, have I an excuse to continue. To make books? Yeah, I'm working <laughs> on another archaeology book right now, um, dealing with the what I'll call the premier Southwestern prehistoric painters, the, the, you know, the ceramics. Yes. And once you pay specific attention to those people, it becomes real clear who the superstars are. And because they have such a unique, distinctive style, if you know enough other pots, you can, oh, that's the same gal. Yeah, you can She's identify the artist. Yep. Yeah. And that's in the process of what I'm doing right now. And there's actually quite a few of these artists that we have more than one example. That makes of. that makes sense. I can. Well, it does, but it's also just amazing considering what a small percentage of these exist. Out of, I mean, originally there it was probably more than a million prehistoric pots in in existence. Now there's about one hundred thousand. So mm. we're finding these within a ten percent group of stuff mm. that exists so imagine if you had that many more pots to look at you would find that individual's work sure you could maybe even see the progression well and there's probably other ways that they can do it technologically that might through the types of uh slips that they use 
uh, fingerprints that are on the pots and all those kind of things too. Yeah, I guess. You know? But, yeah. I mean, artistically, looking at it is just as good. That is a fingerprint. Yeah. You know, I can look at a painting and know whose it is exactly. without looking at the signature. In fact, if, that's the last thing I look at. Right. Actually. I mean, if somebody, I mean, history has always loved any artist that has a signature style. Right. They just are compelled by it. And these women have the exact same thing. The ones who are really terrific and they stand up Mm-hmm. It, a little bit more uniquely than others around them. And once voice. you think that way, and once you can see it, yeah. Was it always women? Do we know that for a fact? Yeah, and it's, um, yeah, at first it was, uh, oh gosh, who, uh, um, Stevens. Yeah, Stevens, Stevens collection. Yeah, Nizuni. Uh, yeah, he was at mm-hmm. Zuni in the 1880s. So, yeah, even 18, earlier, 1870s. Yeah. 1870, and, yeah. of course, he documented, you know, what he found out there. And the Pueblo uh, pottery people were women. Mm-hmm. And that became true everywhere Anglos encountered. It was pretty much always women. Well, also to back that up, uh, I was just looking at a um, oh, one of my books. It was uh, an ex- ex- expedition... Northwest of Monument Valley in 1935, and they excavated this village and all the burials. And in two of the burials, they were older females with a whole itinerary of pottery making tools. Mm. So, and that's not the only place that's happened. So it's kind of confirmed, both archaeologically as well as historically. You know when. You, yeah, and even now, I mean. It's, yeah, exactly. It's, and I like the fact that, you know, sometimes people come into my house and, you know, they, they're thinking they're going to catch catch me up. Like, are you politically correct? Are there any women artists in your collection? <laughs> I said, yeah, well, here's uh, Jean Claus and da-da-da-da. And by the way, uh, there's 65 Navajo rugs. Those are all women. And you're looking at 300 pots. All of those are women. The women in this collection outnumber the men probably 10 to 1. Yeah. That shuts them up right now. Well, there's also one other thing. Is that you love women imagery in your paintings? Yes, I do. I mean, it's yeah. I see a painting, I go, oh, it's a Billy Shank painting. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I did start out painting cowboys in yeah. 1975. I, I'm never going to have women in my paintings. There's always going to be cowboys, and they're always going to be shooting each other, and blah blah blah. And then four years later, I painted my first cow, contemporary cowgirl portrait. Right. And then slowly. <laughs> The women it's have a, taken it's over. It's completely taken over. <laughs> I mean, they're definitely your mainstay. There's no doubt about it. Now, here's the funny thing: yeah. is that this podcast that we're doing, and we're talking right. about the foundation, the museum, will probably at some point be running in the house. This is what we're talking about right now as a loop. Oh, so I can see it, right? Yeah. You're so right. what? Do you, so what do you want to say to your audience that's watching it right now? <laughs> You're dead. I'm dead. This is 50 <laughs> years from now. Huh? Just hope you people appreciate this vision as much as I've had making this vision. <laughs> I don't know. I s- yeah, but it was. It was a real vision. I mean, yeah, you, yeah. you've spent a lot of effort and energy yeah. to to do it. And it's fun to share it with people. And it's fun when I have knowledgeable people come in and, gosh, they're asking the right questions or they make the right observations. It's, yes. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> I did something right. <laughs> well, there is threads that run through your collection. Like the women imagery, I see a lot of that. But there are certain threads. That is yeah. your taste yeah. when oh, you yeah. look at that collection yep. and what you've put together. Definitely. And there's definitely thematics because you like to group things. You like to buy things in group. Yeah. One piece of Molesworth isn't enough. No. Yeah. Yeah, one 100, pot is 100, 107 moles worth pieces is barely enough. Barely enough. Yeah. So <laughs> right. I understand that. I, I'm, I'm, you and I are alike in that way. And yeah. even uh, as I collect uh, new contemporary Western paintings, rarely do I buy Western subject matter, you know, cowboy subject matter. It's usually Pueblo women. No, or I know women. it is. It's just, Trust me, you know. I know. <laughs> I've got you pegged. <laughs> it's a reason you have a lot of stuff for me that goes in your right. house. Yeah. Well, when you find out somebody's taste, that yeah. helps. Even when you figure it out for yourself. Right. You know, and sometimes we don't aren't introspective enough to go there, right? But if you look at my house, you're going to see lots of oranges and blue paintings because mm-hmm. I like orange and blue. Right. I mean, it just well, I think, you know, having also been a dealer... The one thing that makes a successful dealer is when you really do understand the vision of your collectors and you never offer them something that's right. just like 
not right. right. And I've dealt, you know, in partnerships with people who didn't even take that in consideration. I thought, you're going to get, they're going to reject that. That's not what they collect. It's not what they like. Right. This is, right. this is what they'll look at. I mean, you know, you just got to have um, a little bit of sensitivity to how people are thinking. That's right. And talk to them. Yeah. And understand what they like. Then you become a successful dealer. Yeah. And then you have collectors who trust that's what true. you're doing. And that's very true. There are collectors. I don't send information on something, but maybe once every few years. Yeah. Because it just don't, I, you know, why waste their time? I know what they're going right. to say. I know what they're yeah, going to Yeah, you don't like. want to inundate them with stuff that yeah. you know you're going to get rejected. Right. And not overload. Right. You know. And also for those individuals that don't understand what they're collecting yet, I think it's important for the dealer to be able to curate it somewhat yep. so you get them on the right track to the right, right material, not just send them anything to sell them, exactly. but to try to help build a collection. And as you know, when you build beginning collectors like that, you can't, even though you could take advantage because they don't know right. what you should pay or not. Right. Treat them fair, treat them fair. And sometimes, as you know, 20, 30 years later, for whatever reason, some of these pieces are going to start coming back to the market. And you've got it all documented as to how much you paid, how much you sold it for. Right. And you can reabsorb that same thing. Well, this, you've reabsorbed this three times. That's correct. This time That's I'm... because it was sold right yep. every time. And I'm keeping it now. <laughs> or at least I think I am. Right. <laughs> Don't ask about that one, please. But you know, we've known dealers who have clobbered people out on the front end, and then you know you killed them off. They're, they're not going to come back to you once they realize they overpaid. Yeah, or they stuff. buy things. You know, when a collector asks me, "Well, what do you think about these two paintings?" Like they have right. two things. I try to take money out of the situation and go to what I really like and what I think, right. and um, and just you know give them my honest. You know, yeah. take and sometimes it might be the more expensive some, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes I like this one better, for that reason. <laughs> I know when when I was the premier guy in prehistoric pots, you know, I I would get these phone calls all the time and say, "Well, what do you got? What do you got?" And, I, and I'd say, "Well, I have this and this, but it's not for you." Like what? What? I had no idea. Oh my God, that's the best selling film. No, you don't want this. It's not good enough. Oh, well, let me see it. Let me see it. <laughs> or I would get something really terrific and I literally could not afford to keep it. Yeah, I understand that. So this. then they'd say, Why are you getting rid of it? What's wrong with it? There's nothing wrong with it. It's just my checking account that's wrong with it. Yeah. <laughs> You well, know, so true. long as you're honest about stuff like Always. that, it all it just it works. Honesty, you can remember honesty. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, and over a lifetime, that builds trust, it builds reputation, it builds right. all those things. So you know, we work on that every day, and it yeah. happens every day. Things happen. You have to do things and say things, and you know, go. Well, this has what happened. This is what it is. Blah blah blah. Right. So, but once you get used to just always telling the truth. It's easier. Way easier. <laughs> way easier. So many people don't. So t you're in Santa Fe. New Mexico, yeah. at least the Pueblos, have gotten pretty hard hit with the uh, Yeah, the Pueblos right? in the Navajo country. I know the Navajos really have. And I knew when we first started getting the results, like around March 1st and all that, and they showed the different counties uh, on a map in the newspaper daily. Right. And Bernalillo County, which is um, Albuquerque, was the first to really have a lot of cases. And there was nothing up in the upper northwest part of the state. And I thought, this isn't going to last. They're, I don't know what, they're going to get hit. And sure enough, yeah, M uh, McKinley and San Juan County, right. that's Farmington, Gallup, and that country up there. And they're just, uh, it's terrible. Yeah, no. Uh, the, 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 you know, the amount of, cases that keep showing up on a daily basis. I know. What we're doing for our part is that for our blasts, all our blasts that we're giving a part of the uh, proceeds of every sale to adopt a native elder, uh, which provides food right. security, which is a big deal. Well, for... I started donating money to SWRA Southwest, but it's specifically for the Navajo Relief fund or something? Yeah, that's it. Is uh, it the one that goes for the Navajo and the Hopi? This is just Navajo. Yeah. I just encountered it, and I just started giving money. And it, they, you know, they spell out, $9.99 is going to feed this kid, yeah, you know, no. for an entire day or, you know. No, it's a, a huge amount for these. Yeah, and so since I have such an affinity 
for the country as well as having friends, you know, who are Navajo and people I, you know, have as guides and my models sure. and so forth. Yeah, I'm going to help them. I yeah. mean, that Navajos mean more to me than yeah. Well, any we other. we sold a great dress half, uh, 1860s dress half, uh, recently, and I gave the entire funds. Did you to of the from the dress half to wow. adopt a native elder because I thought yeah. what greater way right you know this is you know the gifts of spider woman that was yep. woven to be worn in 1860s it kept them warm and yep. healthy yep. now it gets to go back again that money goes now for again right. the same purpose to give them food and also yeah. for the for the weavers it gives them wool to be able to weave at this time. And the other thing I took into consideration, there's only three health clinics on the entire. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, and I don't know how many th tens of thousands of square miles. I mean, you go to right. Chinle, there's a health center, Kayenta, and then over uh, near Window Rock. And phew, right. that's it. And you got, phew, as you know, miles and yeah. miles and miles of dirt roads and God knows what, you know, to get any help. And. Those clinics aren't set up for something like this. Yeah, no, they have the highest, Navajo Nation, I think, has the highest infection rate in the well, in the United States for sure. Yeah. And I think they're even above New York City now. Yeah. I've known two of my friends, that, have, that are Navajo friends, that have lost people Oof. to it already. And, uh, yeah, and how about the Pueblos in Santa Fe? And well, the, yeah, I don't know what, and they're in Bernalillo County, they're in Santa Fe County, and, of course, I, they're not separating the the new cases, mm -hmm. but um, as I've been isolated until this trip since the heart attack, February 24th, um, I had a, a plumber who was doing some work who comes from west of Albuquerque. So he was coming up the freeway, and I mean two months ago, he was saying, you can't get off the freeways. They're, the exits are blocked off. Nobody can leave the Pueblos or come into them. Mm -hmm. And that's been this case ever since. I mean, they've been in yeah. major lockdown. I don't know how effective that's been because they're not they're not pulling those out of the general statistics. So I don't know what's yeah. happening with the Pueblos. Yeah, no. I, knew, I knew they'd lock down yep. most of them. Well, they got devastated in 1918, yep. right? Pecos went away. It was a, you know, it still had people. Because of the tuberculosis? Well, no, 1918 pandemic the flu pan of the influenza. Flu. Yeah, it literally, down. Right. wiped it out and the wow. remaining ones had to go up to Hamas so you know they don't want to I didn't even know that oh yeah it was really devastating to the Pueblos mm -hmm. in 1918 so and Santa Fe itself is going to have its own issues this summer as far as tourism right uh, yep sure is yeah no but Indian market I will market, say for right? Santa Fe yeah there's no Indian market there's no, no Spanish opera. market no no opera no folk market nope yep no nope. Indians all the shows that we do the antique Indian shows those have all been canceled yep uh, yep, exactly. So, what do you? How do you think they're gonna deal with it, or do you know? Have you talked to the gallerists up there? Um, no, not really. I mean, everybody's yeah. doing sort of what everybody else is doing is just doing it, you know, with the websites and emails and. Yeah, have they opened? They've opened up somewhat now, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, Leroy opened. So I haven't been in the gallery. So but that's Blue did. Rain. Blue Rain. And yeah. so today was what Mar uh, May twenty first. Yeah. So at May twenty first, they started to, opening us up May fifteenth. And, of course, I still think it's insane, you know, unless you're really, really protective uh, to be doing any of that. And since I've had the heart attack, you know, Bunny's been ultra protective of me good. being isolated. Yeah, it's And good. so that's what we've done until this trip. But we actually t brought coolers and t brought lunches and yeah, food you have to. with us. That's right. You know, because I'm eating differently than what I did before. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Salads. No more steaks? Salad. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> no more hot dogs. No more oh, pork chops. Oh. No, <laughs> no more bacon. Yeah. You know, tons of... I made a huge long list, and I taped it to the front of the refrigerator door. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so... Well, I think they do have to be careful. Like, we're not... Even though I could open my doors today if I wanted right. to, I've chosen not to. I've chosen to make it by appointment only, and... I'll I'd, just follow the, you yeah. know, I, I'm going to watch the virus. And if right. it's still have high cases, you yeah. know, you can come see us. You just wear your mask. You put on, a, make an appointment and come on. You get better service anyway because there's no other people but you. Right. Which actually makes it wonderful. Right. 
and it puts everybody's safety. But yeah. we hope, hopefully, people will do that. I'm planning well, to I come to Santa Fe. I just wish everybody was. Jar. I mean, I think the population in Santa Fe is actually more conscientious I would about think. this than anywhere. When we stopped to get gasoline in Payson, I mean, that place was so full of people who were just coming and going. There wasn't a single mask anywhere. Yeah. I thought, do these guys live in a different universe? What? Is, how can they pretend there's no such thing as this huge, humongous worldwide pandemic? I mean, right. it's like you're crazy. Yeah. I think it all comes from perspective, you know? Yeah. And then if you have a somebody, loved one dies, I think you're going to That'll sick, change them. It will change your perspective. Absolutely. So it's a novel virus with you have no immunity. There are, right. is no immunity. You get it, you are going to get some variety right. of illness from not much to death. Right. And so, and you don't know which, where you fall in the, in the realm of that. That's the problem. Right. You don't know where you're going to fall. You That's can, true. But like people our age, I think are more vulnerable than. Oh, 65 and over. definitely anybody's had heart right. disease, diabetes, asthma, right. any of those things. You should be, you got a year to a year and a half, or maybe even two years. You're just gonna have to deal with this, right? And just figure out how to do it, right? And if you, people won't do it for you, you have to do it yourself. You have to take responsibility. Right. I think, in general, for artists, it's probably a little bit easier because, by the nature of our endeavor, we're isolated anyway. Right. Just home in the studio. So you know, I talk to other artists and. What's different? I don't know. Not much. I'm just here. <laughs> right. That's well, true. I mean, you love your house, right? Yeah, right. And <laughs> you know, we have 17 acres, so I don't really have to go very far to be amused, or you know, to have a change of scenery, or. And you have your horses. And we got my horses. And you can paint and you know? be creative. <laughs> and you know, since I'm such a huge movie buff, and that has been, <laughs> you know, the original influences on my paintings. Right. We are definitely buying movies. You yeah. know, like two or three new ones a week. And I'm, I'm going back through reviews from a zillion years ago. And I said, how did I miss this? Uh -huh. This what's, is so good. What's the best one you've seen lately? Well, lately it was um, The Sporting Life, uh, 1963 British, and it was starring Richard Harris. And I've never had much respect for Richard Harris, but I saw this, and this is like early in his career. I thought, yeah. my God, this is really good. And, and the story is unbelievable. I mean, it is a fabulous movie. But I was reading it. In a sports section of the newspaper, uh -huh. and they were just listing, you know, some of the better sports movies there yeah. were to see because we can't see sports. Right. And I thought, how did I miss this? Because I was watching any number of good British films that were being produced in 1964, 65, right. through the late 60s. Never heard of this one. About fell on the floor. He did a man called horse, right? Didn't he? Yeah, but that's. I love that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All Native American stuff, though. Yeah. Yeah, I just don't like what Richard Harris's arrogance. You know, as he gets <laughs> older in his career, he's just oh my god, you know, <laughs> he's insufferable. <laughs> but anyway, so that was one. So you're you're and you're reading more too, or no? Yeah, we we went through. One week or a little more, we decided to rewatch all the gangster movies. And I was always a fan of gangsters anyway. I mean, I was enthralled with, you know, the gang word that went on right. when I was living in New York between Joe Colombo, the Gambino gang, and Joey Gallo when he got out of prison. And they, Joey Gallo, Joey Gallo got killed four blocks away from where I was living. We bicycled over there to see the shoot up scene literally two hours after they'd wow. taken him away. Did you take any photos? No. I didn't. Done any painting serigraphs of Well, it? no, but I did a series of gangster portraits. They were the first portraits I did in 1973. You can see one of them in the back of the black and white photograph of me sitting in a studio chair yeah. uh, in the shank in the 21st century. I still have those. So I used to really be up on my history about that. So I, I, after watching these films, I just ordered a whole pile of new um, gangster, gangster biographies. <laughs> <laughs> so, will the coronavirus change in any way things you do painting wise? Are you going to do anything with a mask or anything? Yeah. No, I'm not. No, not that. Not literally like that. No, it's changed it in the scale of what I've Your done. Your scale, which That'll you know, forced it. me back to try to make portraits that I think you know could be more compelling than what I'd done earlier, yeah. and it's worked. I would think it would affect everybody. 
who's anyway introspective on yeah. thinking about things. I mean, I know I've thought about things differently. How am I going to handle this and that right. for openings and just, sure. you know, all that, you know, because I've got openings coming up and how do I do that? Right. Or do I, you know, or is it all virtual or whatever? Right. So, and I'm, I'm expecting to see some of that change in artists. Though, like you said, I think a lot of artists really don't kind of feel it other than financially they feel it, but from a yeah. standpoint of what they're doing as a daily life, get up, go to the studio and paint. Right. You know, do it again and again. Right. <laughs> I hate to think about artists who are, you know, being compromised financially. I don't know what, I mean, I've been lucky enough that, you know, art hits above water. Plus, just as a matter of practice, I keep a lot of money in my checking account just specifically for, you know, Re, you know, the events unknown. that yeah. you can never right. even anticipate. I mean, this is like the sixth recession or depression I've gone through in my career. And I know one thing, you don't want to be flat-footed with, you know, $200 in your checking account, like in 2008 when the whole economy just right. went... Poof. Right. So, um, so far, I'm doing okay. Yeah. Well, when we okay. sold, I know, a nice big painting yes, you did. in February, yep. which was nice too. And we'll sell more because we've got new art. <laughs> right. So that one last thing I'd like to talk on, because you didn't get to go, but was Julie Saucy's yeah. opening of Lane Horowitz show. That was four show. days, three days after I had the heart attack, so I couldn't, couldn't show right. up. Though you showed up on video. We got to yeah. do it through that. But tell us a little bit. So this is a show that's going on right now, Tucson Museum of Art. Right. And it'll be up. I'm, gonna, I'm sure they're going to extend it. Julie Saucy did a yeah. book, which is a wonderful book, yep. on Elaine Horowitz and the artist. How, what was that time like in, with Elaine Horowitz? Well, first of all, for me, you know, I had been in New York and identified myself as a New York artist from 1970 to 75. And so it was kind of a huge crushing blow to go there to come out here right. full time. I mean, this was where my subject matter was, so that was an upside. I didn't know Elaine Horowitz existed right. until I walked into the gallery, and that was uh, uh, in the fall of 1975. I did know who Fritz Schroeder was. Mm -hmm. I had seen him in Arizona Highways. Um, and so uh, I did hook on with her. And she was hesitant about my work at first. Uh, and then, um, oh gosh, uh, Paul Jenkins had a show scheduled for the following spring in April through May, which then was the off, that shoulder season. That was mm -hmm. like, everybody's gone. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't make it. But I had all these new paintings I'd made. And I pounced on it. I said, Elaine, can I have have this uh, slot? She said, okay, I mean, what have I got to lose? I, there's Nobody's going to buy much of anything. Right. Anyway. We sold like 17 paintings. Wow. Suddenly she paid attention to me <laughs> from then on. Uh -huh. And I have to say, as time went on, I wasn't that much involved socially with Elaine and her posse. Mm. Um, I really didn't hang out that much with them uh i was also equally way involved in my prehistoric pottery and restoring pots so i was socially hanging out with the people that were in that world i would come into plus i was living out in the east valley mm -hmm. and i would come in on thursday nights for art walk which was a huge deal mm -hmm. and um that's when i'd see everybody and pal around and you know um get to know the artists that were in her stable. The embarrassing, shocking thing for me, I haven't seen the book, but I know the paintings in the show, and I thought, wow, I didn't know Howard Post ever showed with Elaine Horwich. Yeah. He was there before me. I thought, whoa. <laughs> and then, you know, Luis Jimenez, he was with Elaine yeah. too? I, and it just went on and on like that. I thought, man, everybody I knew showed with Elaine at one time or another. Yeah, she was a tour de force, I guess. Oh, absolutely she was. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, so... It didn't take long for me to recover from, you know, New York. not New York. Right. Because now I had the best deal going in between the two coasts. Yes. There was no question Elaine owned the whole rest of the country. <laughs> yeah. It was, she, and it was a hot time as well. Yeah, it was. For uh, that type of material. Yep. I mean, especially through the 80s. You know, there was so many people that, you know, started making art and got it sold. Of course, you know, when that next recession hit. You know, they faded away, except for the hardcore, right. real group. Of, right, the shoulders. Of yeah. Yeah, and the Ed Mills, the shoulders, right. the shanks. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's true. Louise Menaces. Yeah. 
Um, so it was very exciting. And the openings, you know, were fun and crazy. And um, I'm going to, the, the one other artist that, well, no, there were two. Uh, the, we had all shown together with Lou Mizell in New York, and that was uh, James Haverd and Tom yeah. Palmore. Yes. So I still partied with those guys, but holy cow, they were way more hardcore <laughs> than me. <laughs> you they, know, they must have quit at some point. At least Palmore. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually. Yeah. But it was pretty exciting, and she was a character, and you had to be tough to deal with her, right? Yeah. But, you know, I got my chops in New York, so I could stand up to her. <laughs> and that's what she wanted, right? It was. She, re, You know, she respected. Uh, I mean, she wouldn't agree with, you know, some of the stubbornness I would stand on, like percentages of, you know, right. uh, painter to dealer. I didn't care. This is what I'm getting. Right. So, Were you still showing in New York at that point at all? No. Uh, and then when other dealers came down from New York, um, they picked up. A lot of people like Ann Coe, who I was living with, and Michael Rayburn, and, and they picked all the way around me, and it just made me nuts. I could not, you know, get shown. I did, in 19, oh, when, what was it, early 80s, I did show with a f Parisian French dealer, mm. and that didn't go very far at all. Uh, but you've had a very successful show in England, right? Yeah. La la for two years in a row? Yeah, yeah. And were you, you were supposed to do it again this year? And I was, yeah. We had... Yeah, we'd already booked flights, you know, to, we were supposed to be in uh, London, May 3rd. Yeah, and so are they doing anything remotely from that or not? I don't know. Yeah, you didn't send them the work, you'd know that. No, they have the work. Oh, so maybe well, they Well, no, they have, they have the original work. I mean, yeah. they got 19 paintings. We still have, to, well, they have all the serographs because they sent them to me to sign. Yes. But they haven't asked for them back yet, so we've got them in boxes ready to, to send over. I don't know. I don't know when they're going to open up or right. what they're going to do. Yeah, they see, that's the life of an artist, that you're dependent on the dealer for most part. Yep. And then, you know, you have this great European thing going on that you're doing extremely well, and then... It's just like, done. you're just going right along, and all of a sudden you got hit by a train. Wham! <laughs> <laughs> you're like the roadrunner. Get up. Right. <laughs> run again. <laughs> and you got the double whammy, because you got literally... The heart attack, right. right, basically when it was just kind of, I mean, I think Julie's show was probably the last kind of thing at all, and then everything yeah. shut down right after right. that. It, yep, you're right. Because we had, you know. I mean, I'd love to have been there, you know I mean? Because I would have seen all, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Well, maybe she'll do another one, though. Well, she is. You know? And, and she's going to be doing that show over at the booth. Yeah. And, um, I mean, we, we, we might fly out there for that opening, Uh since we, you know, have such a good relationship with Seth Hopkins right. and shout out to the booth in Cartersville, yeah, Georgia. Exactly. Great, very great you museum. Know, so, um, but there was a lot of people I would have liked to have seen that I hadn't seen in yeah, decades. Yeah, I'm sure. You know, over here at this, I mean, that was a big deal. Yeah, that was a beautiful show. Yeah. So, anything else we need to talk about, or you want to just go and get in your trailer that's getting a tire done so you can go on? Uh, yeah. Where are you headed from here? Are you gonna? We're go gonna to, go over to Julie Sassy's yeah, house. Yeah, and Hank. You and, can tell her she was on the podcast again mentioned. Okay. <laughs> okay. We don't know the name of the book right off our top of our head, and we both should. Well, I'm excited. See, I don't have my copies oh, of the yeah. book yet. Oh yeah, very I, good. I had to come here and physically. Pick oh yeah, them pick up. it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that show. Well, I know they've extended it, so you can see it at Tucson Museum of Art. And that show is also coming to the museum in Santa Fe. At oh, some it is. Point. Yep. Oh, it's three. I didn't know that. Yep. Oh, that's really great. Yeah. So, well, I'll be in Santa Fe in July. I'm going to go up and do podcasts, actually, since there's okay. not going to be any art shows to do. I'm just going to go up, eat Mexican food, and interview all the people that are interesting. You are rapidly gaining the hugest archive <laughs> of podcasts for artists and art oriented people yeah. in the world. You're, it's I, unbelievable. Well, I have to do it now because, you know, they're going to be gone. We're all going to be gone. Yeah. You know, that's why, you know, I say this is going to be playing in a loop. Well, yeah. it is right now. Somebody's watching and go, well, it is. It is in a loop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, it is in a loop. It's a good passion to have that you've done this. <laughs> it's a great focus. Yeah, and in, and there's some really interesting voices that need to be heard and to put the whole puzzle together of how this worked. Right. You know, and how it continues to work. You know, what's Western art? I mean, how's Western art right. going to look like in, you know, 2050, 2070? Exactly. Yes, it'll still be around, I'm sure. Yep. Uh, but it may have changed even more dramatically. 
It will. I mean, it continues to. Maybe we'll have our first Native American president, and she will uh, really push it. <laughs> you just don't know, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it would be nice to have a Native American as a, a real American president. It would be pretty cool. <laughs> I like the idea that Biden's going to, you know, have a, a female vice president. I like yeah, that that's a interesting. Lot. Yeah, no, and I the do. The fact that he's only, if he gets elected, planning to have a, a one term deal. And yeah, to we'll be see able if, to that, if that really happens. I know, but, but boy, you know, power, power corrupts uh, total. Yeah. But the, the year of the woman really has changed because, like, the. Um, uh, one of the museums, I think it's the Baltimore Museum of Art, is only collecting women's art for a year. That's it for wow. the museum. No one, no others. Yep. Wow. So they've been underserved for a very long time. Yep. You know, and so I think it's good that they. We were just talking today that. about, you know, Susan Rothenberg uh, just died. Yeah, I saw that in the obits <clears throat> yesterday. She was, I didn't, I don't know, I didn't remember to know that she was, you know, married to Bruce Nauman. Yes. I guess they were out in Galisteo. Yes, yeah. And did she die in New Mexico? I, I don't know. Yeah, I saw it in the New York Times know. of it. I mean, Bunny made me aware of that yeah. when we were driving over. So Another one I missed for my podcast. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's the worst thing. There's people that you wanted to talk to, right. and then you they're on the list. You know, I have that list. And then they pass away, and you're like, ah, all that history lost forever. Yeah, and that could happen, you know, Anybody. unfortunately... Right now, anybody uh, more unexpectedly quicker than yeah, for before. sure, especially for older people. We lost John Prine. I was a yeah. favorite singer yeah, songwriter no. of mine. Dennis June recently passed away. Yeah. I don't know if you knew that, but that was before, just right before all this. Uh, Dennis was on my hit list for sure. But you know, I'll do what I can do, and hopefully, people will still enjoy it. And thanks, Billy, for driving to... eight hours, and then I grab you. How about <laughs> right. a podcast? One more <laughs> time. <laughs> Right. <laughs> well, I think it's important to me. I mean, you went through some real crap. I mean, you know, having a yeah. heart attack and going through coronavirus and, you know, you have a different take on maybe life than you did. Maybe. I just, I am i don't have any problem with being mortal. I don't, I've yeah. never, for decades, that's not been an issue. I yeah. always used to think I was going to live hard and fast and die young. Well, pfft. You know, got to be 30. Whoops, missed yeah. that one. Whoops, 40. Whoops yeah. again, 50. Whoops. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, my time's coming. It's, and well, it's for okay. everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I have a lot to get accomplished before I'm your, done. Your prices will go up. Yeah. Hopefully for money, they will. <laughs> <laughs> and the dealers that hopefully are still yes, around. Yes, true. So, yeah. yeah. On that happy note, <laughs> right. Billy Shank, thank you for stopping by and talking to me. I know you weren't expecting it. And, uh, but, but thank you for having yeah, me. Yeah, I'm Mark. glad we could it. do it. Yeah, <laughs> Billy Shank, another installment on the Billy Shank podcast. This one's really interesting. <laughs> Thanks, Billy. Okay, All right. we'll see you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it would be nice for you to be able to see uh, Julie. We need your support for the Medicine Man Gallery channel, so make sure to click the subscribe button and tap the little bell icon to be notified when we upload a new video, which we do every morning on Wednesday and Friday. See you soon.